Podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Kids, do you like professional wrestling? Well, you're in luck. We like professional wrestling too. This is Shake Them Ropes. I am Jeff Hawkins. He is Chris Novembrino. Chris has disappointed me by not winning the Mega Millions. We're not billionaires. Jeffrey what, has what disappointed me by being mean to me <laughs> on a weekly basis Wait, on this show. This is, I started off with the, the false, call. This is a no, false I, I said this week you need to not be rotten to me. And 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 look at how we are coming out the shoot. This is a false narrative. That it's is, not no, is, no, this is it's this is real news. This is me, this is me, unfake news. Let me ask you this, because uh, this this is uh, something that happened. I thought this was part of my quote unquote sickness, but I guess it's not. I I, I get up early because my body clock is still at 530 in the morning for the most part. So I wake up at six. I do my laundry. And then by 730, I'm back in bed and I wake up at 11. Like, what the it's like, why? Wait, so wait, you think tired? that's a medical condition? I thought it was because I'm just like, well, why am I so tired if I'm not, you know, like I'm not staying up late. I'm not, you know, losing sleep. I'm not lacking from sleep. It's just. What if you have like sleep apnea? Have you ever considered that? Oh, I do have sleep apnea. So, okay. Well, <laughs> well is that why? Well, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, that would like... mean that you're not getting deep sleep. So like you're okay. laying down, but you're getting shallow sleep. And okay. so you're not really feeling rested. I have never, uh, I have never gone to medical. That's why they call me Doctor Nov. Yes. A lot of people just think that's an on-air gimmick, but no, <laughs> I, I faked <laughs> several moments of medical school. They call me that's Doctor Love. Nov. Oh. They, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Doctor Love, but yeah, they and they do call me that. <laughs> they call you Doctor Love too. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. yeah okay. they do. All Some right. People call me Maurice because I speak of the pompatus of love. Um. <laughs> I I'm when the last, space cowboy. <laughs> space cowboy. George Papard and Battle Beyond the Stars. There's a reference. There's the arcane reference of the week that I wanted. I don't even know what that reference means. Oh, so it's, there it's, you it's, go. It's a it's a, it's a uh, Roger Corman produced film written by John Sales of all people when he was still in the uh, trauma verse. But it's it's a takeoff on the Magnificent Seven, but set in space, starring Richard Thomas, George Papard, John Saxon. It, it, it's pretty cheesy, but it's pretty awesome at the same time. Uh, but but George Pappard plays this anachronistic character where he's a cowboy in space, but his name is literally Space Cowboy. There you go. <laughs> so it was during, you know, it was during when everybody wanted a Star Wars knockoff. So so everybody was investing in cheap, bad looking science fiction. Also, uh, I believe Sybil Danning is in there to sex it all up. So it's kind of never mind no no (laughs) my last thought on this is one of the weirdest takes on anything i have seen recently is someone who very doggedly was trying to claim that star wars was not that big of a movie when it came out in 1977 (laughs) (laughs) and it's like well, it only did this much in 1976. Right? Hours. No, no, like, the, oh, it, it, it was much. It mm-hmm. was a young person who was thinking about it, just kind of like in terms of box office numbers, but not remotely considering all of the satellite culture <laughs> that clearly rippled off of well, Star also Wars. Also, not remembering that home video virtually did not exist, so movies could stay in the theaters for two years. At I remember Superman two stayed in one theater where I was at for two years because it was still a, a hit then so yes it wasn't that big of a hit yes that's it more one of the stranger takes i've seen anything in recent weeks when last we checked in with shake them ropes it was about an hour after vince mcmahon had stepped down from wwe since then triple h named as head of creative for wwe we are now a week out any thoughts chris on uh wwe uh that you did not get in last week because last week was hot takes now more tempered takes yeah no la- last week uh in-, in jeff being rotten to chris you harangued me I I Hara- no you that. harangued me you harangued me yes it, it how I'll, i'm gonna tell you you harangued me for talking about kevin dunn when we set up 
<laughs> the, the Vince segment. But I got to tell you, buddy, I tried to watch that opening match on SmackDown, and, and I sent you a clip. How often do I actually, like, send clips of, like, the show and go, like, no, this was really bad? Like, the camera work right now on WWE is, for any television show, rotten just unbelievably bad if you want to see what i'm talking about you can go to at dwatg i posted the clip there um like on twitter you you, you can see it it's like 18 seconds there are like i, I didn't even count cuts or anything like that because it hurt my eyes to look at this um he's horrible he needs to go um in terms of hunter becoming the head of creative my concern is not the reintroduction of paul levesque somewhere in the org chart my concern now is that he is like the head of talent relations and the head of creative okay. and you need checks and balances in this system like <laughs> no you do like, like i know i'm just <laughs> never mind it sounds no i know it sounds governmenty but like i i i mean i i knew i was i'm borrowing that obviously from no like, government i, I think terms. you're overall correct but i don't think there's ever been real checks and balances no in WWE. But that's been a problem <laughs> okay. uh, jeff the absence of checks and balances yes. is one of the problems Pretty in the much. org chart. Yes. It is responsible for the recursive stasis that the product has been in for 15 years as one man's brain slowly atrophies. You need like other people to go, hey, I don't know about that. It actually kind of check it. And like, I think having talent relations and creative be sovereign kingdoms um, managed by two different people is a very important division in a wall to have up that got tore down this week. And I think that's bad. I think you're obviously correct. Um, I, I, I listened to a lot of the discourse over the week and everybody just needs to cool their jets. <laughs> that's what they need to do. Uh, because I mean, we knew before SummerSlam there was going to be no real sweeping changes, and I understood that. But I am under the impression that any changes in WWE are going to be incremental and at a glacial pace, including even if Kevin Dunn gets axed. Because as you can recall, I think it was about a year ago where the guy who was allegedly going to be the heir apparent to triple to to Kevin Dunn got got fired or left the company for another job. So basically we're we're at the stage where if Kevin Dunn's going to go, he's training his replacement and he's going to be able to see that he's training his replacement, I think. Uh also just I mean it's it's weird how we work in this wrestling bubble compared to other people and even other industries. Because we look at wrestling, we look at WWE and say, this isn't working. But all they have to do is point at the scoreboard. They've never been more profitable, Chris. Why would you change, a, uh, why would you change your horse midstream, so to speak, if things are actually working? That's why I don't think there's going to be grand creative changes necessary. There'll be stylistic changes. Like, I mean, if you watched Raw on Monday, much more loosey-goosey. Yes. Kind yeah. of fun. Yeah. I, I will admit that Raw was kind of fun on Monday because I could, liked Raw. SmackDown was painful, but yes. I actually enjoyed Raw. Yeah, but you could tell like nobody was screaming in anybody's ear during commentary. Yep. That, that they were blowing an angle or something to that effect. I mean, it was very loose, very, you know. You I really mean, felt it, it on the fun. commentary booth. Like, yeah, like the commentary. The, dude, the booth just felt liberated. Uh, What's his name? The lead guy now. I can't remember his Jimmy name. Jimmy right. Smith. Jimmy Smith felt just looser. He he's very much settled in here as their lead commentator. That shocks uh, me. That really. Does. I know. That's I the know. One thing that shocks he, me. Is he that, settled? Is that and, and we were to. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. We were talking about when they tried out that other guy, uh, Viv or whatever his name was. Uh, oh, yeah, he's he's in the Levitard family. I can't. Yeah, I, I want to say like Viv Durka, but that's not like his name. It's just like the, the, what's coming up in my head right now. That guy lasted, but we were like saying it was kind of on thin ice. You can't keep changing the lead commentator. Smith is settled in great. He's got good rapport with Corey Graves. He knows how to rib Saxon. Saxon, Graves, and Smith clearly like each other. And now that they don't have someone yelling at their ear in their ear, and Smith like gets with the job, like he doesn't need the training wheels anymore. Just let this guy like handle the show. He's not going to like step wildly out of bounds. I think you can trust him with the ball. Um, and he understands what Adnan the product is. Verk is the name. You're Adnan right. Verk. There we go. And I think, I think if you brought Adnan Verk back today, I think he'd succeed. I think, I think this is purely a Vince thing. 
and Vince has a has a has a certain way and a certain cadence and I mean he's he's basically telling you how to say I mean you can hear a Vince cadence in a guy that has Vince in his ear at all times that's true Vic Vir- Joseph got kind of molded into that too and, and but Virk Virk's a fan of the product and I think you need in some ways people who are fans of the product now in my old school days, it, it, it would also, <laughs> it also be sometimes annoyingly so, but I mean, I've always felt like the play by play guy should root for the baby faces in some ways. And they don't really do that on, on raw right now, right now you kind of have good angel, bad angel, straight guy, which is. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. It, what I will what, what I think, especially in the old days where it really kind of worked best is when you had like the league guy doing play by play, but like, Play-by-play play guy appreciates good sportsmanship as a virtue. Yes. And ipso facto likes the baby faces, not because they're good, but because they compete in the event in a sporting way and dislikes the baby faces, not because they're bad people, but because they don't compete in a fair way. Right. Yeah. No, I, I would agree there uh, 100%. But um, like I was saying, I think uh, I think you're going to get some some more collaborative things between – the writing team in triple H because triple H from what I've been told uh, is, is very open to ideas, including ideas that Vince rejected. Um, yeah, that's cool. And, and I think like, if you're going to see, I think you'll see incremental change on raw. I think what you're like, what you're saying is just a loosening up of things. It's not going to be a revamp re-architecting of raw. Not immediately. Things are going to get style. Lo- isn't going to change. That's the thing, but that's the thing people want. People want the, quote unquote sports entertainment presentation, I think to get a little bit rougher around the edges and for the way that they, they I just present, want the like camera the, the, to be held in place. That's like, all I, I want. I want to get rid of the 20 minute opening promo segment, but I don't know if that's, but that's been around since the attitude era. And I don't think that's ever gonna, because they view it as, well, we're setting the tone for the show here or whatever. And I just like, Dude, you can you can look in the camera for ninety seconds. Say you want to beat the crap out of somebody and get out of there, and I'll be jacked to the gills to watch it. This this way they do it. You know, last week on SummerSlam, I vanquished the. <laughs> oh God, stop it, please! But it works. There are people who like it, and the the the, <laughs> the books have have a certain profit level that makes everybody happy in 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 Stockland because. <laughs> So no, no, totally. A single hit uh, over this whole thing. You mentioned the scoreboard argument earlier, and it's I, I've always, I mean, we, you and I both kind of have always found it fairly compelling. And I think essentially the one thing that we argue is that okay, if WWE is able to put up this score, if you're going to make the scoreboard argument, if they're able to put up this score with this level of sub mid product the the proposition is and i think it's fundamentally yeah. sound that they could be making more money with yes. better product yes but i don't know see i don't know if that's true i, I, I no, i, I generally that. think the lanza the lanza analysis on vince mcmahon of no one has made more money and left more money on the table yes. is basically correct it's very correct but but i'm looking at this as you know it's kind of like when people argue like your your favorite craft burger joint versus mcdonald's now, but nobody goes to McDonald's for quality product. And no, no matter how many times they try and reinvent themselves as a classy burger joint with, you know, like, oh, they've done this a hundred times. Wait, wait, there is that there is that one guy in like Wisconsin who has been going to McDonald's every day and he's yes. like now 74. And he his assertion is that McDonald's makes a quality hamburger. Yeah. Well, the reason I mean, he eats not, there is because they're a quality burger. It's not a horrible burger, but, it, you know. It, no. It, 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 it's sus, it's sustenance. It, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's suspect. It's suspect, too. No, I would grant that. But, you know, you know it, what it's I'm sus. <laughs> I mean, you look at McDonald's and every like every five years they get it in their brain because they hire some new executive chef that what we're going to do is we really want to we want to appeal to the more upscale bougie type of person. So we're going to we're going to make these, you know. Uh, the the sit down restaurant style burgers and they never sell because people want the cheap crap and and, and, and and they may not want the cheap crap but they can afford the cheap crap because the the bougie stuff they don't want. So what, what I'm basically saying here is that there's there's a there's a certain there's a certain uh, percentage of people who like McDonald's 
for McDonald's and get nostalgic for McDonald's after they haven't had it in a long time. That That's the WWE fan base for the most part. If you changed this to be more, you know, wrestling, I guess, there'd be, I mean, it wouldn't be everybody. There'd be a lot of people who would appreciate it. But there'd be a lot of people who just went, well, this isn't what I want. Where, where's the, <laughs> as, as I've always reminded by both a sports radio show host who is a lapsed fan and the guy who was sitting behind me at Dallas WrestleMania, where's the Dudleys at? <laughs> you know, and that's all they want. They just want to see a guy power bomb a dude through a table. That's all they want. I, I mean, when you say wrestling, now, I, I think we need to update it, kind of like the way that we generationally update the term butt rock. Like, we're not talking about, like, wrestling from the 70s and 80s anymore, I think, when people want wrestling. I think when people want wrestling now, they want, like, attitude era ECW stuff. Like, Maybe. like I said, no, I really, I really do, th- like, I... I you got to remember, dude, like there's a whole Gen Z out there now. There's a yeah. whole millennial generation. Like, yeah, you you do have the people like me who are millennials who like retro wrestling. But well, like, I call it retro wrestling because I did not grow up watching AWA. I, I watched it all archivally. Um, you know, so like, I, I, I mean, I think the term needs to get updated periodically. Well, when I when I say wrestling, I, I, I think it's, I think it's cross generational because I think all people want to do is see a fight. And 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 they don't do that in WWE. They don't want to. They don't. You know, we're gonna we're gonna have a championship opportunity where two guys. Well, it's just somebody's turn to do the dance. No, they want to see Stone Cold come on, beat the crap out of somebody, flip a couple middle fingers, have a few beers, whatever. But that's you know that 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 can be you know tr- to to like Dusty Rhodes style bloodbaths in the eighties if you wanted that too. I mean, it, it's it's all. You know, I mean, I, I think we just gotta update the the, the platonic form, right? Like to all me, right. like now, no, now wrestling is. Bret Hart putting Stone Cold Steve Austin in the sharpshooter while Austin is bleeding and the double turn is complete. Oh, I think that's even passe. That's not even nostalgia anymore. I because I think that's you know that's like the NWA isn't or the NWO isn't even all that nostalgic anymore. It's, it's it, we're in a brand new world where people have never been in a boom period. It's very weird because people are nostalgic for ROH now. I guess I don't know. I mean it's 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 odd. But uh, speaking of ROH. Pay-per-view this past Saturday looks to have gotten, I think, 26,000 buys on pay-per-view with, uh, I believe that's terrestrial pay-per-view. I don't think that's just fight TV, but we will see about that. But uh, some news and notes coming out of there. First of all, that the FTR Briscoes rematch lived up to all the hype. Uh, Chris has not yet had a chance to see it. I watched it live. Uh, I, I adored the match. Uh, it was a fantastic, fantastic tag team wrestling match. Still not as good as the first one, though. First one had so much heat to it. It'd be almost impossible to replicate that. But this one, it was a tale of three different matches and they were all very, very good. FTR just having themselves a hell of a year this year. Uh, And the Briscoes, the Briscoes are just the best. I I love the Briscoes. I am hoping of all hopes because, hey, if AEW is not going to put them on TV, I think there's still out clauses in ROH contracts if WWE comes calling. I, I'm here for Briscoe's Usos, Chris. I really am. I think that's this I think that's now the super fight that everybody wants to see happen. Maybe maybe uh, it's just me. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, no, the Usos are Usos are pretty good right now. I'd like to see the Briscoes and the Usos. But much like me in 1993, sitting down to watch a WCW pay-per-view, waiting for the Reunion of the original horsemen. <laughs> Once again, Tully Blanchard, no longer part of the company. Once I start watching and Jonathan Gresham had it out backstage, backstage drama, as it was reported by Fightful and others at Jonathan Gresham at a meeting with one Tony Khan backstage and uh, cussed him out, screaming, yelling, blah, 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 came out, sans octopus mask and flag lost the title in the opener to Claudio Castagnoli and 12 minutes. Also of note, Tully Blanchard no showed reported reason, uh, travel issues with a booking he had through his prison ministry, but news coming out of there, but nothing's been said officially or unofficially. So Tony Khan said, well, he's in perfect health. Uh, the, the rumor is that uh, he will no longer be a part of AEW or ring of honor. They got around this by having, Tully Blanchard Enterprises be sold to Prince Nana and uh, the embassy. 
this is interesting. And this, of course, I need to elaborate a little bit because <laughs> look, Tully Blanchard is, is of course my favorite wrestler of all time. I would love to be optimistic and say, Hey, maybe he's correct. Maybe through his prison ministry, he had a Saturday booking and then they didn't send the tickets to the right place. But I think you'd say that, but communication has been lacking between AEW and some of the lower tier talent at times. That, that's, that's just, that's been noted. Uh, Gresham could have been talking to Tully a little bit and say, Hey man, I'm just going to have it out back here. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, there were obviously plans for this Tully Blanchard enterprises because they had already had merchandise made up. Tully is a guy, look, he he's been a malcontent for years. I get that. He's 68 though. He's, he's out kicking his coverage on a wrestling contract. I don't think he's going to be a malcontent any longer. There's a possibility. I will, I will grant everybody that, that the worst possible reading of this happened. But if you remember when, when Tully Blanchard was a malcontent, he was always a malcontent on behalf of talent, even though the talent was him. Like when he, when he got in arguments with Dusty over booking and, you know, he said the, the standard, well, if Dusty, if Dusty wants to uh, go over so much, maybe Dusty can book himself against Dusty. He went to the TBS people or to the Turner people when they were gonna, going to buy Crockett and basically had it out with all the grievances he had that ended up getting him kicked out of the company plane and, uh, and basically being persona non grata and led to him going to the WWF. When he left the WWF, that company screwed him over by, uh, by releasing an old drug test. It wasn't a recent drug test. They, they released an old drug test to screw his contract. It's always been Tully versus the promoters. And in this day and age, we cheer that sort of thing. Now we kind of villainize Tully for doing what people we cheer him for. I'm not saying he wasn't a malcontent. I'm not saying that his daughter isn't a malcontent. The Blanchards are well-known malcontents. I'm saying maybe Tully has mellowed in his old age, and maybe it's not the, hey, he just decided to no-show to screw a booker type thing. Yeah, I, I think, I, I don't know. I, I, I just don't know enough I have about the same this. The, the, I no, the, the, thing, the thing that makes me, I guess, certainly open to hearing more from Tully is the way Gresham was being handled. Yes, um, and, and, and let's get into that, because that is the thing that, I mean, I am sympathetic to Gresham here, up to a point because he is the champion. He has been the champion in absentia since ring of honor went under. Uh, he, he's been represented, but he's, he's never given up the title. He's defended the title. As a matter of fact, you don't turn a guy like that of that magnitude heel. And then the next week, just have him lose the belt. You turn him heel. You have him establish himself as a heel champion and you build up the contender along the way to take it. You don't just turn him heel because look, Gresham is his product and he has a right to defend that. And look, I had no problem with him going backstage and yelling at, at, at a booker for a while to, to defend that. But once you get the answer, that's no, you have to become a professional. You have to put on the happy face or whatever. You can't, you can't Sasha Banks it out there and put it all over your face that you're about to lose in this match. Now he, he wrestled a pretty good 12 minute match. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, it's like, okay, and also let, let's, let's add this to it because I had avoided this talking about this on the dynamite show that I'm on, but uh, now, now it's a part of the conversation and it's part of Tony Khan's handling of talent. Gresham had shown signs of frustration in an interview with Russell Pierce, where he said, quote, it bothers me that you can have a white guy. Number one with no character be great, but then you've got black guy same. Oh, he needs a character, but why, why can't he just be a good wrestler? You've got to be so much more than the other guy that's world champion. Doesn't have a character. He's good on the mic, sure, but he doesn't do anything other than wrist locks, hammer locks, and some kicks. But black guy that does the same thing, I need an effing character. I need all this extra stuff. Like, that's just the thing. To quote Sam Kinison in the 80s classic Back to School, is he right? Ah. Uh... Okay, I had that same noise. <laughs> right, no, because it's like it, he's trying to make this weird division between good on the mic and have a character. And I don't know that that division is so super clear. Like, if you're good on the mic, it's indicative that you have a character. Yes, thank you. Because, look, I, I know 
there, there was a certain facet of wrestling commentary that were trying to make this a little bit of a racing with Tony because of the big swole stuff. I, I don't think good wrestler is a good character. I just don't. I, I, I know. And when, he, and, and when he says, why can't a guy just be a good wrestler? The first person that pops into my head is Ricochet. Like, I have watched this movie. Why? Because then you're Ricochet. Um, he's a fantastic wrestler. I, I've watched as many matches. I've watched a bunch of Ricochet matches. I loved him as Prince Puma. But when he wasn't good on the mic, as in Prince Puma didn't have much of a character, it was the death of him. And that's why you can't just be a good wrestler. That only works so long. Wrestling is a, it's a story. And being good at the stunts is great, but you've also got to be good at the story. Yeah. I mean, Brad Armstrong was a great wrestler. Vanilla never drew a dime, but if, if I mean, but you know, Ole Anderson, also a very good wrestler. His whole thing was grizzled tough and trying to break your arms and legs in there. That's a story. It took Zack Sabre jr. Becoming a heel for me to be even remotely interested in him as a wrestler, because he finally was using his talent to, to, you know, inflict pain on somebody in the ring, as opposed to, Hey, I'm doing this show. I used to call it bugs bunny offense, where you know, he's just doing it for laughs. He tie up a guy, ha, squid ha, him up. This. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That, that kind of thing. John and Gresham on that last dynamite before the pay-per-view or no, the second to last uh, on uh, and it was rampage where he was, I think it was a Lee Moriarty match or Sean Dean. I can't remember which one of those guys it was, but you know, someone in that vein, uh, on that level and he was just he was just uh stretching a guy stretching a guy was a story it was it's been a story for 30 years in wrestling a guy who's technically sound but does it to inflict pain because he enjoys inflicting pain that's a character choice that's not just i'm a good wrestler type of thing and that's and that's what i've always thought guys like that lack i mean danielson had that for a while too i mean in, in ring of honor and when people go i'm the best technical wrestler in the world great whoop de crap you know <laughs> you know it did danielson's a good example of where like you can sometimes find your character or persona yes absent the microphone um like you know as daniel bryan i think so much of it wasn't about like promos it was about finding that yes energy and yes, like you know the... about, it was about glomming off diego sanchez's yes chant pretty much. sure Sure. Like, no. And, and, but like, you know, more than that and establishing character beats inside the ring yeah. and stuff too. So like, why can't you just be a good wrestler? Well, being a good wrestler is a means to an end. It's not an end in and of itself. Um, like you, you, you do good wrestling to yeah. get your character over in the ring or on the microphone. Uh, my last thought on Gresham turning heel, um, is this is an interesting it's an interesting and fair point of malpractice on Tony Khan in the sense that if you're going to ask someone to turn heel, as you were saying earlier, Gresham does have a right to protect his brand. Um, and, and like what his character is and everything like that, you have him turn heel. It's really important that, especially if you've got the world title, you have, as you were saying earlier, several defenses of that belt to really establish the formidability of this new heel persona, because to simply turn heel and then drop the belt the next week sort of almost implies that turning heel is a downgrade in your power level. Yeah. Um, that like you, you've like made a step in the wrong direction that you're like now less relevant. Um, you, you essentially mid carded yourself or something. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think Gresham has every right to be mad that, you know, okay, I'm turning heel. And in addition to turning heel, it's not like, okay, I have to lose the belt the next week in a 40 minute classic that sets up the next eight months of programs between me and Claudio Castagnoli, where I'm trying to like, get the belt back through any means necessary because I didn't feel I rightfully lost the belt in, you know, a four and a half star, you know, classic. This is 12 minutes in an opener. Yeah, no, like he's got something. I I'm with you at a certain point. You got to suck it up and do it. But like, no, does he have right to be, you know, a little BS over this. Yeah. It, is this something that we should look at Tony Khan and maybe go like, is this, is this guy always a visionary? Mm, I don't know. This is not a visionary move to me. And I, I'll push back a little bit on the Gresham quote a little bit here, because just to balance things out, uh, there are guys who say, Hey, they're, 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 you can look at a guy and go, okay, his gimmick is good wrestler. But like Daniel Bryan ha had a fun, likable, charisma i almost you know if i was gonna put it in terms of movies you know a george clooney slash 
even Ed Harris in the right stuff is how I think because they always ask why was why was John Glenn the main character of the right stuff? It's like well because he was the guy who had charisma to to him even just a friendly aw shucks type of charisma that that was Brian Danielson's character in WWE. Uh, I think people are a little bit too dismissive of oh well his gimmick is only he's a good wrestler when there's more to it like the guys who say I'm a good wrestler I, I view as the kind of the grapple efforts the uh, you know Thatcher drew gulag types who then eventually when they got to wwe both of them got charisma oh, injections charisma. and i love both of them now yes. like, like i now love drew gulag and i love thatcher and we both saw them in the indies and we're kind of like eh, 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 it's fine I thought they were dead in the water coming in yeah 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 like yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then they came in found their person and, and like you know what it helped them be better yes uh, dare i say it entertainers dare that, like, i say that wwe does do some good for certain types of wrestlers in terms of making them more well-rounded no now, yeah it's really it's really interesting their their wrestling school is very bad at te- making wrestlers wrestlers but the wrestling school can be very good for people who have wrestling ability already and need to work on character work and that sort of thing the the, the, the both criticism and uh analysis that it's a finishing school for wrestlers i think is apt i think i think they're a lot i mean look for all the jokes people make oh wow does finn balor really need to learn how to find the hard camera blah 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 there are guys a little bit like riddle because riddle riddle was kind of a gym meathead as well but he i mean he had charisma there they just had to refine it a bit but like thatcher gulak guys like that who needed to find a find their hook even so Tommaso Ciampa, I, I would say, is a yeah. huge beneficiary of, of this. Is yeah, a music finishing as well. well same, same there. I mean, because, you know, he was kind of dull and vanilla, and then he got in that guy in the tag team with, uh, I always call him Martin Stone, but whatever his, his WWE name that I always forget is. Gargano? No, 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 no. Uh, uh, Oni Lorcan and his oh oh oh, 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 uh, oh, oh, uh, oh, one and two. I yes, forget what they called two. them. So yeah, 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 one and two. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, th- they're guys that 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 actually help their cause by being in this system that you think would work against a guy like that, and and we need to take that into uh, account. That said, as the end, oh, one other thing, injury news: uh, Dax Harwood working with a torn labrum, as as we've been seeing. I I don't think I think he's going to wait for surgery, <laughs> and he should. <laughs> he can work through the pain. God bless him, but he is having the run of his life right now. You hate to see a guy working hurt, but, uh, you know, if he can get occasional rest here and there, hold off that surgery as long as he can right now, brother. Yeah, no, working at a high level, working at a high level. That will end the new segment of this program, and now we dive into the lazy river of wrestling criticism. Whatever we watched, whatever comes to mind, whatever uh, whatever random thoughts – over the course of this wrestling week we have, we will do uh, before we get started, we'll be on the beach of the lazy river as we do a SummerSlam a preview SummerSlam, the former number two pay-per-view in this company. One match struck from the card as a kayfabe injury to Matt Riddle was filmed on Monday. So he and Seth Rollins are out. Although Seth Rollins isn't down but I think that's more because his wife and baby are probably also in town. I would not read too much into that, but eight, eight matches on the card. Chris, starting with Logan Paul versus the Miz. Uh, I think Logan Paul really wants to be liked. Uh, and <laughs> this is, it, this is square peg round hole territory. Uh, it, it, it is. It, 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 it's hard to watch, dude. Like it's just, it's hard to watch somebody who's so naturally unlikable yes. doing his best. It's like watching Rhonda doing their best to like endear themselves to a crowd who doesn't want to like them. And like, it, it makes you hate them even more because you like, you just go like, no, like, just let me hate you. And yes. weirdly, yeah. And weirdly like them holding that back only makes them even better at being a heel. I, I mean, I, Logan Paul has to win this. I, I, I I'm assuming, uh, I, I like if for no other reason than they need to just like end this angle. Cause it's not working. There are some people who just give off natural asshole vibes. I have been in this position. I know this. You are never going to get the love of the crowd. 
So you might as well just lean into the hate sometimes. I mean, this guy, I think the Miz is in that territory. I think Ronda Rousey's in that territory. I think Theory's eventually going to be in that territory too. You know, it's the honky tonk, man. It's a Tully Blanchard. I mean, look, he was a baby face young, but dude, even when everybody loved the horseman, they wanted to see Tully get his ass beat. I mean, that was, that was the money in the horseman right there. So yeah, sometimes just be, you know what? I that, think- that exchange between Maurice and Logan uh, on the show, yeah, just, yeah. oh, uh, be, when the Miz came out, it, it was very much thank you, Miz, for me. Cause it, he, abs- <laughs> no, he saved that segment. They were having such, a, I mean, the, the ball measurement stuff was stupid, but like at least Miz could come out there and carry the horrible ball measurement angle. And it's also just, it's, it's, it's an anachronist. And this is something where it's like, I, I think the script was already written. So they just went with it, but watching a man insult a woman in, in, in a ring like that and, and just downgrade them in a misogynistic way, it's uncomfortable to watch sometimes. And, and the way they present it, it's always uncomfortable to watch. So yeah, I, I did not enjoy that at all. Next up, the Mysterios, Mysterio family theater. Oh, we got a lot of it on Raw. Oh, it was so good. Oh, it was so good. Oh, I, I, oh, I, I Raven, so Raven Stereo could do 30 minutes. Uh, Jeff, I, I, I love this man. If I ever see another Ray Mysterio promo again, oh, where 15 minutes of it are dedicated to Eddie Guerrero, uh, <laughs> no. I, will, I will not, I will not be unhappy. God, are there any other lucha? To, can, can you at least thank Psychosis for getting you on the radar, Ray? Come on. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, how about Ultimo Dragon? Like, he's yeah. still with us. Uh, very important for getting him on the radar in WCW. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, he did say, he, no, he thanked Dean, and Dean was Dean was a great feud, too. But, like, when I think of, like, Ray's best feuds in WCW. Well, that's they not were, a part of history anymore. It's only WWE. Yeah, yeah I, well, but, yeah, I know. But it, for me, it's Malenko and Dragon were the guys <laughs> he was having the like, great feuds with. Anyways, the worst hero turn in recent memory, other than Jonathan Gresham, was the Dominic Mysterio five minutes in the Judgment Day one done two weeks ago. And guess who they'll be facing? They'll be facing the Judgment Day of Damian Priest, Finn Balor, and Rhea Ripley grabbing Dominic by his crappy mullet, hopefully again, because that made me laugh. That one cracked me up was Rhea Ripley just coming in, grabbing Dominic by the hair and just <laughs> ragdolling him. No DQ tag team match, which means Rhea's getting involved somehow. Do, does Team Mysterio get the happy ending for his 20th anniversary week? No, I think I think Dominic is still turning heel. Oh, do you? Yes, I I, I mean, I heard someone else talk about this. It's not entirely my own thought, but the uh, it's slowly but surely Dominic is starting to resemble Eddie more and more. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> he's gonna call him dad eventually. <laughs> no, no, it, it, it just he he's starting to. Yeah, I I just I sort of think this is. I mean, it's always seemed that to is me such like a crappy looking mullet, just like Eddie's. Oh, my right. God. No, I know. Yeah, no, it's. It, it, this is my favorite worst Eddie look uh, that yeah Eddie had. <laughs> I, although the mullet's back now that you have uh, Eddie on Stranger Things too. So like may, maybe maybe being Eddie and having a mullet like Eddie Van Halen or Eddie Munson or Eddie Guerrero is going to be a new thing here in this decade, Hawkins. Yeah, I hope not. Um, <laughs> I, it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a positive development. Bobby Lashley, your WWE United States Champion versus Theory. Still not Austin Theory in a rematch. Theory takes okay. Your view of this is going to depend on what you think happens in the main event. Let's let's go with what you think. I don't think Theory's winning the title here. No, I, here no, no. I I mean, I, especially with with the way he was talking about it on Raw. No, I, I just I don't see him winning. Okay, I will I will save my beg my question begging for a second. Uh, Bundling home and car insurance with GEICO is so easy, your neighbors are probably already doing it. But who? They may drop little hints like... Beautiful day out. Even more beautiful since we saved by bundling our home and car insurance with GEICO. Or... Yard work is hard. Much harder than bundling with GEICO, which was easy. Or it may be even subtler, like... Speaking of burgers, we bundled our home and car insurance with GEICO and saved a bunch of money. Bundling is easy with GEICO. Just ask your neighbors. Can we get to the main event? Liv Morgan, your SmackDown Women's Champion versus Ronda Rousey. Yet another rousing feud, which ended up with Ronda Rousey just coming in, interrupting a match, 
turning it into a tag team match and Liv Morgan holding the belt to her face. WWE, everybody. Does Liv Morgan actually retain against Ronda Rousey? Oh, wow. This is a tough one. Oh, I, God. I, could, I could see unnecessary heel turn here, too, but we don't have enough baby faces to last us in this division. Yeah. Man. Uh, ooh. I'm going to say she does, but I feel this is the I, this is the one I feel very noncommittal on. Here is, okay, I will go with a creative ending for this because I was trying to think. I was saying maybe Liv gets desperate and does something to hold on to the title, but no, I'm going to go the other way. I think R- Ronda Rousey gets her in an arm bar, wins the title, refuses to let go, gets DQ'd, Liv retains. Okay, and, and that and so Liv does hang on to the title, and we turn Ronda heel. But she's still not a star, you know. She right. doesn't get the right. No, I, I just could. Yeah, it's in my head. I just can't see Ronda fully putting Liv over, and that that's the thing that was really making me like gun shy on saying, "Oh yeah, Liv retains." But that makes sense. That's a good way of doing it. And what and I th- th- oh go yeah ahead. No, no no that would be, that would fit into the way Ronda typically likes her booking patterns to work, shall we say? Yeah, and what I think is going to be a fun match for at least one participant. Pat McAfee versus Happy Corbin. I think we're going to the well a little bit too often with Pat, but I like Pat. I do. I really like Pat McAfee. He's a welcome presence on the show, even when he says something stupid. Uh, Corbin's been getting the upper hand time after time after time. McAfee has to win this, right? Yeah, I hope so. I, all I hope is that this is built into a McAfee madcap Oh, like God. a mad cap fee, maybe. Don't put that evil out there, Chris. No, please. mad cap fee would be fun. That'd be a hoot. You and Joel Pearl can go f yourselves with this mad cap. I want I, we, no. If we're if we're gonna fix Raw, what we need is longer Mysterio promos and mad cap fee. <laughs> the Usos, Jay and Jimmy, versus the Street Profits, Angelo Dawkins and Montez Ford, in a tag team match for the undisputed championship. Double J, J E double F, J A double R, E double T, or it's J E double. Yeah, okay. Yeah, his his name's hard. No, no, I was I was trying to get the cadence of when the laugh was. No, I know, I know, I know. The special guest referee, currently involved in the Flair last match as well on uh, on Sunday, and uh, we didn't talk about that up top, and I don't want to get into it too much in the Lazy River, but at least the the build of that's been fun, although. You basically have four heels fighting each other in that last tag match, which is funny in its own right. But anyways, who wins here, Chris? Maybe we'll get into it in the Lazy River. Who knows? Yeah, you know, I mean, we're in the Lazy River. Well, I mean, I guess we're in the on the beach. We're on the beach. The la- we're on the yeah, beach. I mean, we're proximate to the Lazy River, Jeff. I mean, if you really think about it, like yes. at least we're not, we're not putting our toes into the water at yes. a minimum. Yeah, I think it'd be, it'd be wrong to say that we're completely dry at this point. Uh, this is the most interesting that Jeff Jarrett has been for me in a long time. I like this character of his and he sold the hell out of that super kick. Uh, I thought he was good. Um, I, I like Jarrett. I, I think that the profits win the titles here, but I feel like they're turning heel or something. I thought that this would be a place where Jarrett gets his, re- I mean, the, the straight ahead story here is that Jarrett El Cabong is one of the Usos gives the street profits to win and they get their they get their undeserved tag team title reign even though they deserve it you know what i'm saying i mean they didn't yeah. win it they i think we're gonna get into corporate politics here again and i just i just and this is my fear my fear is they've been building up this jared's gonna turn on the usos thing to the point where it's a swerve and usos he hits angelo dawkins yeah hey Heyman's paid off jared Heyman's paid off jared and Jared, as a corporate stooge, wants to keep the money train rolling because Roman's the big dog and blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to go with the Usos win again. He does kind of feel, I'm getting Nick Patrick vibes a little bit. I, yeah. I, I had that thought, too, where it's like, OK, what if he's like going to be Roman's new heel referee? Somewhat intriguing. Bianca Belair versus Becky Lynch for the singles title at Raw for I mean, for, for the Raw Women's Championship here. Uh you go, Chris. I need to think. Uh, I'm going to say Bianca wins. Um, I, I feel like Becky's character is being done so goofily right now that like it's not like a setting her up to win the title sort of character. It's a setting her up as a challenger character. 
I think Bianca needs the win. I think there might be another contender in the wings. Uh, Aunt Pam is in the wings, I think, waiting to come back. So I think she does win, but there's just that part that there's that Vince McMahon instinct in me that says, man, Becky's just killing it with this character work right now, even though we find it annoying. Vince, Vince is the type to love this type of stuff and to belt her again and have, and then we can heat up Bianca on the chase. There's a part of me thinking that can't get there just yet. I'm going to say Bianca retains here and then eventually feuds with either Charlotte or Bailey who return. But uh, yeah, I'm going to say, I'm going to say Bianca Bella wins this. Do you have any credence to Becky Lynch winning this title? I mean, that's not a bad argument other than Vince isn't there anymore and Triple H likes Bianca, so I don't think he's going to want to do that to her. You're right. Yeah. Roman Reigns, your undisputed WWE Universal Championship versus Brock Lesnar, who returned to SmackDown during our, <laughs> even after being reported as leaving TV that day after Vince quit in a last man standing match. The question is, does this remain one-on-one or have all these theory teases, do they come to fruition here and theory gets involved in this match, Chris? I mean, if theory gets himself involved in this match, he's, I, I just view him as he's like going to be an unsuccessful cash in. Yes. Yeah. I, I, he, he has Damien Sandow written all over him. Um, except that like, I actually enjoyed Sandow's character a lot more than theory's character. Um, but, but both of those guys, when they won the briefcase were not hot enough for you to credibly consider them to be world title challengers, nor was their in ring where it needed to be to be able to, to sort of meet that uh, threshold. Like I love Sandow. The in ring wasn't there. I like, Theory, he's good in the ring. He's not a world title contender, so he's sort of like Mr. Irrelevant to me. I think he's just a means to getting Roman to win the title. So he's a Rube Goldberg device. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I don't – I mean, I think I think Lesnar's losing here. I think he's losing in like one of those, you know, Mick Foley puts the forklift on the rock sort of like finishes to last man standing. I don't think like Roman obliterates Brock Lesnar, but I think Roman stands tall at the end of this. Let me add another interest to you because they've teased this now, even though, even though they always go the opposite of what's on TV for their booking or they have Drew McIntyre's just claymoring the crap out of Austin theory of late. Is it possible that Austin either his, his way is foiled because it is a last man standing match, making a no DQ and Drew comes out and claymores him or the other two just beat the crap out of him. It's one of those two things or that Theory does get a successful title win here in order to feed Drew in like 30 seconds in the stadium in, in Wales and crown Drew a champion quick and get the big pop from the crowd. Man, I would hope they wouldn't do that just because like 30-second world champion is such a bad place to take your belt. Okay. Um. You know, I, I mean, especially like think about what we were just talking about with Gresham. I, I know, like I, I would I would hope they wouldn't do that. I would consider that to be a bit of malpractice, even though I'm not impressed by theory. I don't think that would be doing theory any favors at all. A quick other couple of uh, WWE slash NXT hits before we go into AEW on the Lazy River, because I just I think we've dwelled enough on, on WWE type stuff today. Uh, Ilya Dragunov with a hell of a hell of a title defense on NXT UK against uh, Wolfgang. Uh, just, just, just a slap fest. It was, it was pretty damn fantastic. Uh, NXT did nothing for me this week though, Chris, if it did anything for you, let me know. No, no, it didn't. Uh, I mean, I, I, I watched it casually this week just to see, you know, what we were doing, oh, but Rox- I- you know, the Lunder blaze Roxanne Perez stuff was stupid. I mean, why are you giving up a title belt? What are you doing? <laughs> just, I, I, I mean, I'm just hoping that they hit the reset button on this thing. And and unlike Raw, where the ratings are good or whatever, NXT's ratings suck. And I do think that a revitalized NXT would draw viewership. I mean, if, if you could get the buzz going around that brand again, that it's back to something like its heyday from 10 years ago, 
that I think could it could excite and interest people again. Okay. Uh, I'll let you go first on the lazy river because I interrupted you there a bit. I mean, no, you're fine. You're fine. Um, okay, let's talk a little uh, Moxley and Roosh here. So, I mean, basically, we just run down the dynamite card here. Pretty I feel much. like we, yeah, yeah. So, um, Moxley and Roosh, um, I thought it was a good match. Um, I love Moxley's promo at the end where he's like, I am not the interim champion. He needed to say, I, I absolutely think he needed to say something like that. Um, my only knock on Roosh is this: he just didn't, you know, necessarily feel like a credible world title challenger. And I think having a title match in the opener is not like Moxie's promo is great. I just think you don't put a world title defense in the opener. The the world title, even the interim world title, and and especially if you want to make a stop saying even the interim world title, the world title needs to be defended in the main event. And you need to always build world title angles to world title angle status. Um, otherwise, this is a great match between Moxie and Roosh for me. Really enjoyed the match. Uh, I I questioned I questioned what you do with Roosh now. He's he's unsuccessfully gone for the big title. I mean, you can put him right. up against the Lucha Brothers, but I mean, you know that that has. For me, that has diminishing returns. I don't. I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm just. Maybe I. No, just no. This is the other reason it. why I, I think it's just really important that everyone who's involved in a world title angle, even if it's just a weekly on TV angle, it's done in a thoughtful way. That yes, Roosh now has challenge for this title. He has to kind of take a lap now, and so you want to like when you you know have Roosh do that, you know, figure out what the lap looks like. How's he getting ahead of steam back? Yeah, and I mean. Um... Like, Moxley, Moxley and Jericho, I, I, I'm not going to lie, like that, what, he's going to come back as a Lionheart. I, I don't know that the faces of Jericho intrigues me as much as it does other people. We will get to that in a little bit, because I don't know if you watch Rampage, but they brought up a stipulation. Um, uh, that, I did not watch Rampage. That, that might, not oh, okay. that, uh, might not give you that match, but I'm going to say this as well these TV quote unquote main events that they're doing, you know, your, your fighter fest, your fight for the fallen, your uh, quake at the lake type things. They're killing the world title builds a lot because they're feeling the need to do these two and three week title real quick program type things. Uh, I would just bypass them. I'd, I'd leave the world title off of these things and just build the, the four month hot angle that you can't wait to get to the main event. Let the lesser titles be, no, no, that sounds all fine and dandy, Jeff, but it's not like they got other belts on this show. <laughs> they just announced the trios title. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I thought Roosh, Roosh was definitely, Roosh definitely had, how would I put this? Almost a Brian Cage, I'm going to get my stuff in, whether you like it or not at times, in the early going to get the heat on Moxley. I mean, there were times where he'd get like kicked and he'd just no sold it and go back into his thing. He had a bit of a mission where, look, I'm going to lose this, but I'm not going to lose my shine over it as well. And it kind of made for a far more interesting match for me. I don't know about you. Yeah, I know. Um, I I was certainly... I thought kicking out of the Death Rider was certainly a choice. <laughs> it was a choice. <laughs> that was certainly a choice. I I get that it was sold to... No, you just transitioned it into the Bulldog choke, but I'm sitting here going like... Huh. Huh. Did okay. You, did you do that too? Did you? Huh. Okay. Yeah. No, I had that exact reaction. I was just like, all right. I'm sorry, people. If you want me to dislike uh, kick it out of finishers, which I do, I got to stay consistent on this. That, that that wasn't a strong move. And I don't think that was uh, to parlay the new head of creative best for business sort of move. Just well, take the take the fall off the Death Rider. Come on, I buddy. will flip from the opener to the main event. Okay. Because sometimes you do things correct, but you do them in the wrong way. And that was this. Chris, I have, I have now said for weeks that we need to have one of those times where one of these young guys gets one over on the vet. Clean as a sheet. This was the time to do it. They had the story. They had the perfect story here, Chris. Brian Danielson coming back, coming back from an injury. And in J- Japanese wrestling, a big star comes back from an injury sometimes loses his first match back. And that's the story that they tell is that the ring rust and the time off did it. He got DDT on concrete and he has concussion problems. This was the time that the Jake Hager grabbing the foot through the apron thing. 
completely unnecessary. You can get the heat with a post-match beatdown. But, and they treated it like it was clean on Rampage, which was very, very interesting. But on Dynamite, Daniel Garcia should have beat uh, Brian Danielson clean and get the shock out there. And I think that would have helped him immensely. Do you agree or disagree with that statement? Hmm. I think that I, I like the idea of Garcia beating Danielson. Uh, I absolutely think that that's a place that like Garcia needs to go at some point. I would have used Garcia beating Danielson here, and I would have had him do it basically clean, but I would have established early on that Danielson's not 100% from the concussions. That they he's were made- trying that, though. They did that a bit with the neck and everything. He was kind of shaking it off a little bit. They were They were talking about it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. But then to have Hager, this is the problem. Stick to that one story. Yes. You know, you're, you're not, now it's you're going to the spice rack and you're grabbing every spice in the house rather than just cooking the recipe with one targeted spice. Um, no, once Hager does the, uh, you know, horn swag go under the ring gimmick, um, <laughs> now it's no longer about does Danielson have a concussion? Um, and, and, and part of that is that the Jericho Appreciation Society is saying whatever problems Danielson still has due to this concussion, we don't think it's substantive enough that Garcia can win on his right, own. Right. Um, and, yeah, no. So, like, it does undermine that story. You got you to gotta choose a lane. You got to choose an adventure. Your turn, sir. Um, okay. Let's, uh, well, you know, I guess we can wind it back here to uh, Jungle Boy speaking. Okay, good, because I have this on my list as well, because I I have just promos in general, because there was good and bad this week. And uh, 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 go ahead. So I thought that on balance, this was pretty good stuff from Jungle Boy here. He's clearly thinking about what the next step is for the Jungle Boy persona and thinking about his promos. And I thought, like, this did a nice job cleaning up the so far incoherent of this to a certain degree, which is to say that like he didn't buy Christian's story about getting eliminated from that one match and has his own theory that is more plausible um, that he needs money because of the divorce. Uh, I I mean, it's a bet. It's a better story. It's a retcon, but it's, it's certainly a better update of this. And I think that kind of, also sort of ties up why Christian's, you know, being so crass to, you know, his wife and stuff, you know, like like there's there's a lot of stuff going on here. I didn't think that it did a good job really explaining the dynamic between Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus at all. I found myself like asking like a bunch of questions in my head about like, okay, what do these guys talk about? How do they clean this up between themselves? Did you also think that there was possibly going to be a Luchasaurus turn? Yes. In this promo? Yes. I, I mean, He's still all black and evil looking, and it doesn't seem to... What's bizarre to me is that Jungle Boy doesn't seem to acknowledge that his pal has went from, like, wacky, zany Luchasaurus to evil, brooding Kane Luchasaurus. Like, if if you showed up one day, Jeff, and and you were doing eyeliner and a whole goth thing on me, and I I just completely no-sold it, that'd be weird. It'd be as weird as you doing the goth and eyeliner thing. Um, but like, like that's what's happening here. And like Jungle Boy, it's the one sort of like lingering in the air question of like, okay, but like you notice that your friend's acting like totally weird, right? Nobody ever wants to see me in goth. Trust me. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Now I kind of do. Like the next time we go out, uh, the, you know, the next like wrestling show we link up at, please. <laughs> will you do the whole weekend in goth? No, no, I won't. I'll get, I'll get you a KMFDM shirt, my friend. I look like Bella Lugosi and Dracula. Um, Bella Lugosi's dead is something that you could listen to when you become goth. <laughs> Classic track. Uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna venture out into uh, promo land here for three different people, but I'm gonna include Jungle Boy. I'm gonna go with him first. The first seven seconds of that promo were awesome. Where I mean, it was kind of like the Fuego del Sol thing I was talking about last week. It's the Eddie Kingston thing. If you have the fire, you have my attention. And him taking that pause and then him just looking at the camera and, call, and, and calling him a piece of S and, you know, a, a P word and all that other stuff. Fantastic. That's what I want. 
It doesn't actually have to be more complicated than that at some point. No, like sometimes just you just you, you wanna... just think that they're a piece of crap. Like, like, like yeah, like you. I want to yeah. kick your ass. Boom! Yeah. There's a great feud. Hey, how about that? Nobody ever talks about wanting to beat the crap out of people anymore. Yeah, or <laughs> I, I mean, even a baby face just saying what a pleasure it would be to finally like just like lay a deep hurting on the heel. But the other stuff was way too overscripted and way too clever by half. Look, I appreciated the divorce thing. But it's, it's an old improv note. If you choose an emotion, you got to hold on to that emotion until you can naturally find a way to transition out of it. Or you go through it, you bring it up to an 11 until you evolve into another emotion. And he did. He went from angry to snarky joke teller. And I was just like, all right, it got the crowd popping. But did it work? No, you're totally, you're totally right. Like he took the, you know, he was at like an eight and then inexplicably from starting off at an eight dials himself back down yes. to about a four yeah, or a there's, five. There's an old phrase in improv. It's just because you're making him laugh doesn't mean you're being successful. And I thought this was unsuccessful, even though he was popping the crowd a little bit here and there afterwards. If he had done a Costanza and just left on top there, the seven seconds, boom, out of there. Cool. You know, even if he had left halfway through, it would have been better. But then he gets into the story time and the exposition and he's starting to say words. And then Christian gets shown and he gets to interrupt and stuff like that. This was a time to give Jungle Boy the I'm going to kick your ass promo. Let him cut the whole thing. Let him get the big crowd reaction afterwards. Let him leave. And then and then you get Christian's thoughts in a backstage pre-tape later. That's all you need to do here. But this interrupting promo crap continues to hurt people. And in the end, look, Christian cut a pretty good promo too, but it didn't really help either character, I don't think. It kind of kept them in stasis just a little bit, in my opinion. No, I agree. And I, I at, at a certain point, you have to start moving some plot through Luchasaurus. He's clearly too much of an important character in this jumbled story that they are telling uh, he's the tug of war. He's the rope in the tug of war between these two guys. And like not, everyone's speaking about him like he's not in the room. Now I'm going to go to somebody who did a, a complete 180 on me. Oh, did you have another thought? I'm sorry. No, no. I was literally just about to say it's bizarre. It's bizarre. How bizarre. Du, 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 du. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> life as a radio DJ. Uh, Friday, you did not watch Rampage last night. I'm going to tell you something, Chris. There are times I have to come on this show and I have to, I have to eat my hat proverbially because Rob McCarron. That's, all, that's never, the only way it gets done on this show. Because Rob McCarron never did it literally. Yeah, we know. Uh, Wheeler Yuta showed personality and it was fantastic. And he was suave and funny and humorous and i was like where the hell did this guy come from because i have never seen him in a promo like this he was awesome he did a tete -a -tete with jericho was, i'm a wizard <laughs> he's doing a lot of that doing a lot of i hate that guy on on uh commentary last night but jericho came and interrupted claudio and and yuda doing a promo putting over their roh wins and and says and basically offered to uh offered to put up his title shot against moxley against yuda on this week's dynamite um and yuda oh no i can be and yuda basically no sold him but he goes no i know i can beat you can't i beat you can, regal do you think i can beat him claudio do you think i can beat him it was a great promo from wheeler yuda and i was just like okay now i'm more into wheeler yuda you just got a little bit of that Daniel Bryan, quote unquote, chemistry going where he's likable, snarky, and and it was really, really good. And I was shocked by this, Chris. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen it yet, but uh, it, it, this would be a real positive development. And I think like Regal's tutelage, we always think about him as like a great technical mind and a great in-ring character and, and all of that stuff. But he's also fantastically dynamic as like a person and a personality. And, you know, I think he has the ability to tease that out of others as well. And like Wheeler Yuta would very much be a beneficiary of learning from Regal's charisma, uh, even more so than his uh, technical prowess. And the bad, but getting better. And it's, it's, it's marginal, but we're working on it. 
Anna J was in the uh, was in the main event slot on Rampage last night, going up against Ruby Riot, and had to do the Mark Henry, uh, you know, uh, face off before beforehand. And as a heel, seems far more confident in her promo skills. Still kind of doing the mean girl type of promo that you get in like NXT slash lower level WWE type things. She's now rebranded herself as Anna J A S slightly clever and, and her thing. She's, she's obviously getting some tips from, from Jericho here because she's now, she's now the person who's going to, cho- I'll choke you out. I'll choke you out. I'll choke you out type of thing. No, she's turning into X-Pac. Like she's like the X-Pac of the JAS. A little uh, bit. Uh, no, especially what, I mean, naming yourself like, you know, like yeah. X-Pac naming himself after DX. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, uh, and yeah, no, I mean, at first I'm like, this is goofy, but then I remember it's like, she's supposed to be this. This is what the JAS thing is supposed to be. Right. Uh, look, you either like this faction or you don't like this faction at this point. I think they're, they're very divisive uh, on, is this good? Uh, and I, I'm on the negative side of the, is this good debate? I'm still split. Cause it depends on the person. Cause I love 2.0 and, and Garcia. Yeah, I know. I know. But I, I just think as, as a whole package, I, I don't know that it is good, but it, it, it is what it here's is. The thing that's also, she's going to need to work on. And this was in the match and the match <laughs> match was a little rough sledding at times. She's going to need to learn how to sell better as a heel, because as a baby face, you don't need to sell as much as you do as a heel because you're, basically trying to make that baby face look good at all times. Then it was rough sledding in this match. Let's put it that way. But uh, she at least showed a little bit of personality in that, in that, in that promo. So I'm going to, I'm going to grave on a curve here and say uh, not dead yet could get better. So there it's your turn, sir. If you have anything else. Okay. Let's see what else we got here. Oh. What did you think about Thunder Rosa versus uh, Miyu Yamashita or Yamashita? I'm trying to make sure Yamashita, I say it. It's, I think it's correct. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I know it's not Yamashita. I know I'm just trying to get the uh, <laughs> much like I know, the, I, no, I was trying to get the uh, pronunciation right. Yeah, Yamashita. Yeah. Much like Takeshita. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I really didn't like the first two thirds of this match. I thought it was rough. I thought. They yeah, I, the I know it, it, it's it's Thunder Rosa as champion is it's unfortunate i in my head i just i always thought she'd be a little bit we thought the fire would always be there yeah it's not yeah it just doesn't it's yeah it's just not working and i I don't i'm not even blaming the sandbagging stuff at this point it's like it's 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 beyond that because i think so much a lot of the audience isn't probably aware of the sandbaggy thing like something else is just missing in her ability to connect with the audience um I don't know. The promos haven't been good. The backstage vignettes have been dreadful. No, I think too. uh, It maybe is important for the Thunder Rosa character to connect more with the younger girls in the audience. Um, you 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 know you need to see that like young girls love wearing the Thunder Rosa face paint and all of that stuff, and and she's not really. I don't know. She's just not endearing herself to the fans like the way I think you need to as the babyface champion. She also doesn't have a rival. She doesn't have somebody that she hates and she can build up other than DMD. Right. Which brought out the best work of her career was when she was feuding with Britt Baker, which is that's true, but, that but, but that doesn't help her. Him. It doesn't help her bond with the audience because the no. audience loves DMD so much. Yes. Yeah, no, no I, I, yeah. I, would, I would agree there as well. Um, uh, I'll, I'll end on this for mine. Uh, what do you think of the Starks hook uh, Hobbs stuff? <sighs> Man. Uh, um, I think that Starks is so solidly connected to this audience that the kind of weird trans like like did the two one minute thirty second matches with uh, Dan ha- with Hookhausen really make a lot of sense to me as a narrative story? Not really. Uh, I mean, I get that. Like, it's like I don't know. I, I, Danhausen hits uh what's it Stark's shoulder against the pole or whatever and then like Starks goes that wasn't absolute even though he's absolutely injured from this um and <laughs> it, like and he knows this and then he gets like routed by Hook and at the end like he fist bumps Hook like this was legit even though like Hook is clearly preying upon a weakened Starks I, I like 
it was strange. I, I just kind of went with it, and and I looked at it more like, does it work for Hook? Does this audience like Hook? Yes. Does this audience like Starks? Yes. Is Taz uh, kind of well connected in in the story and like an interesting character and everything right now in, uh, in the booth and stuff? Like, yeah, yeah, he is. And Hobbs makes sense as a heel. So I think in this case, all's well that ends well. But if you're asking me to individually defend the beats as like these were fundamentally sound moves, it's like, no, it's just stuff works because people like Starks. People like Hobbs or people actually do like Hobbs. That's true. Um, That wasn't what I was trying to say. People like Hook and people are willing to give a lot of leeway to these three to get get us to wherever we need to go. Yeah, and they did the same thing when there was a very similar story, and I'll get into that, I think, as I make the comparison. But I think there's a lot of – there's there's a few landmines here that they need to avoid. Um, yeah, Hobbs – you know, people like Hobbs, but um, uh, where am I going to start with this? Uh, the real danger in this entire angle is that Ricky Starks is a certain kind of personality. And, you know, everybody's made the rock comparisons – I, I think personality wise, probably true, but there was a danger in that when the rock was the rock, because he's the snarky insulting type of baby face. He has a bit of a Sammy Guevara problem right now where it could easily be taken as obnoxious heel. The types of lines that he's doing. Um, if he continues to do the same kind of insults and funny insults that he does. Uh, the turn was interesting because he's cutting this promo about not making excuses, just bad luck. And then he's almost ready to railroad Hobbs when talking about when Hobbs and I, and then Hobbs basically did the keep your name or keep my name out of your mouth type of thing. When it comes to this, why we were failing type of thing, which almost comes off a little heelish on the Stark side where it looked like he was going to basically railroad Hobbs. See, time. okay, all right. I, I thought that they mishandled that one last beat, and that, and, and I'm glad that you came up with that different analysis of it. Because here's how I read it, um, and I didn't think they let it breathe long enough. And and I think this is a real good example of why. My take on it was what Starks was about to say is that's why me and Hobbs need to go and challenge for the tag team titles. Like, okay. and, and I think he needed to spit that out first, and then Hobbs just hits him in the back of the head. Um, because like. It, basically what he was saying is this sucks losing your belt as a singles guy sucks but now it's time to go onwards and upwards me and Hobbs you know like we tight and we're gonna go for the belts we're gonna finally win these belts um that's where I thought we were going with this and, and I think maybe it you've sort of nicely illustrated why it needed to be a little bit more clear what Starks was trying to get out there in terms of a thought yeah I thought Taz's reaction wasn't great either like of course he's rooting for his son but at the same time this is his stable that's coming apart here when hook goes to challenge him no he really should have been like okay like when he says this is surreal for me he should have been like wait why the hell is this happening yes yeah that a bit next week what's gonna happen he's gonna he's probably gonna side with hook and and starks who are both gonna be baby faces hobbs now i'm kind of intrigued as to where he goes because there's a couple of I mean, look, they always put people in factions of some kind. It looks like they're breaking up some factions because they teased, of all people, Ethan Page going with Stokely Hathaway uh, during Rampage. So who knows if Lambert's long for the company. But Hobbs, I mean, there's an obvious one, but I don't know how good it would be for Hobbs in that you bring back Brian Cage to team with him and they go after Starks and Hook which would be interesting. Another one that I thought about possibly like, what if this, I mean, this was part of the Tully Blanchard analysis, but what if the Tully thing is entirely a work and they're just taking them off TV until they reintroduce MJF and Spears again. And then Hobbs can be the new Wardlow. And then you eventually build him back up to a baby face turn of sorts to do it that way. But I, I don't, I mean, I, I no, I think you, building up Hobbs for Wardlow it is a very smart move coming off of this. I thought that would be it too, but see, my fear is that they're going to end up sticking in with something like, uh, you know, that he'll also be in this Stokely thing, which it looks like they're just going to put nothing but minority people with Stokely, which I think is a bad move because they just also turned, uh, they turned Lee Johnson during, uh, 
during Rampage and had him go with Stokely. Um, oh. So I mean, yeah. I think Stark and Hooks, uh, Stark and Hook, um, are gonna be. They're gonna be a unit as Team Taz. No, they're gonna Taz be a unit. Gonna I think involved. that they're gonna be really well received. I, yes. I, I, yeah, no, I, I think that this is a faction kind of like how FTRs really kind of super connected. I, I right. think that yeah, you could get Starks and Hook pretty. They're already there. I, I, I just it Starks is and, and they work so great as um contrast right like hook is like super understated super cool yeah it's, starks it's, is cool but he's like super outgoing super you know like the, the extrovert stoic which is what happened with, with which is why hobbs and starks worked so well as well yeah yeah but like but like even hook hook has sort of orange cassidy charisma too like, like yeah. it, no, the, they're both charismatic i i think no i i think it's gonna be I think it'll be fine. I, I I mean, I'm with you. I thought that there were maybe some like issues here, but none of them were none of them rose to the level to me of where I thought it was working against any of the people there. So, you know, it's not it's not a Christian jungle boy thing for me. SummerSlam's about to start the pre-show. Let's end it there. You guys will get this probably after SummerSlam is over. So, you know, we'll see how we did. It's been Shake Them Ropes. I am Jeff Hawkins. You can follow me at Crap Game 13 on the Twitter. You can follow Chris Novembrino for now at DWATG. Is, is oh, oh yeah. You think Musk is going to win that lawsuit? Or, or no, you think he's going to no. lose that lawsuit? No, and then he the has ones, to... You were the one saying you were going to leave Twitter. Yeah, if, if Musk finished the purchase, but uh, he choked. Uh, yeah, uh, you know. Uh, oh, so it was conditional. It was, I, I, Jeff, just because you don't, don't listen doesn't mean that it, uh, my position Anyways, changed. Chris tends to do something, I guess. I think it was like a show about politics. No, and, speaking of things something. that Jeff doesn't <laughs> listen to, it's called Don't Worry About the Government. You can find it over at patreon.com slash DWATG, where we're starting to get like a, a fun little discussion group going on over there. Uh, you know, people are starting to participate and everything, and that's great. Um, I also am now doing... Uh, music courses so uh actually after uh i did music of the mat last week with andrew rich um there has been some in interest from people who listen to that show about like music podcasts or that sort of thing and actually all this summer i have been doing a music camp and now this fall i will be doing music courses so real quickly here on august 27th uh, I will be doing a lecture on Nirvana and Grunge, uh, which starts around noon central. Uh, all of these are $25 a pop here. September, video game soundtracks from Mario to Sonic to Halo to Cuphead. Uh, that's September 24th. October, uh, if you enjoyed the Ozzy Osbourne show that I did with Andrew Rich, you will enjoy even more the Black Sabbath uh, course I am doing on 1029. That is October 29th. Uh, November is 80s pop music. Keep running up that hill, Jeff Hawkins. Uh, that's going to be on November 19th. And uh, in December, we'll be doing The Strokes, uh, which will be December 17th. So if you're interested, please reach out to me uh, at DWATG on Twitter. Or, you know, you can uh, message me at Chris Novembrino at gmail.com. You don't get enough of me on wrestling. You can hear me on the Dynamite Show over at Fight Game Media, five bucks a month on their Patreon all sorts of other shows, but we all are also a part, as Chris said, of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network, flagship with Rich and Joe, Music of the Mat with Andrew Rich, uh, Open the Voice Gate, just about anything. They have all your coverage of G1 and other federations that we may not cover here. This has been Shake Them Ropes. Goodbye. <laughs> Keep running up that hill. <laughs> We're like Sisyphus. Geico presents Daily Affirmations. Repeat after me. Our thoughts are like the ocean. Our thoughts are like the ocean. Our thoughts create our reality. Our thoughts create our reality. We're thinking Geico offers claim service 24-7 with personalized attention from an assigned team. Geico offers claim service? Um, I, I wasn't thinking that. We think it and it becomes our reality. So, uh, what about washboard abs? Let's give it a go. Think really hard. Okay, abs, abs, abs. Yep, abs. Keep thinking. To manifest more Geico in your life, go to geico.com.